Welcome to Force, for Free- Force to Freedom, part of the Seeds of Liberty Network. For more information about this or any previous podcast, please visit the website at theseedsofliberty.com. Visit our Facebook page at The Seeds of Liberty, or you can find us at, on iTunes, Stitcher, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, my name is Lloyd, and uh, my co-host here is uh, Donnie. Donnie, how's it going tonight? See? See, that, that, that was a fine intro, sir. I told you it, it, it would, wouldn't be as bad as you think. <laughs> so how are you doing tonight, Donnie? Uh, I'm tired and sober. Two things you should never mix together. Well, you know, I, I just woke up at uh, uh, nine, eight, eight, eight-ish, eight-ish, I guess, and I'm on my second beer. So I got you covered on both sides, buddy. Got your back. <laughs> so uh, oh, something. Rub it in. Something Ooh. which. Something which. Ooh. Eight, eight. Poor form. To be fair, to be fair, I am <laughs> I am flagellating myself here because I am drinking corporate beer. It is a Budweiser Platinum in my hand. Uh, not a shock top or some yummy, delicious line and Kugel or anything like that. So, uh, you know, th- this is my penance for my hubris. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, just to uh, uh, give you guys yeah, an idea Come on, you gotta admit something on. like something civil, you know, like the cocks you had to suck in college or something. Nothing, Not like you're drinking Bud Light. You don't ever admit that. <laughs> yeah, you don't but, tell anybody no, that. No, not Bud Light. No, no, I would never. <laughs> it, it, it would have to be a desert, one of those desert episode kind of theories, right? Like, hey, you're in a, you're in a, you're in the desert, and there's a Budweiser. Ooh, uh, is the born on date good? You know. <laughs> uh, so okay, so just, uh, just take take it like a man and die. I mean, <laughs> go if you got to go, go with your pride and your boots on. Don't don't pander. So if you guys hadn't determined already, uh, this is going to be kind of a loose and informal uh, podcast tonight. Uh, we're going to keep it uh, kind of low-key and conversational. And as, as such, we're going to try to get keep it out of the brainiac academic side, which is, more, I guess, more my, my uh, tendency to take things. And we're going to just keep it more conversational. We're going to take a look tonight real quick and brief and conversational tone uh kind of like the developmental stages of our insight learning and inspiration things things sources from which we've drawn over the years so uh yeah so just to dive right into it donnie what what was it uh that uh what were the figures personas whatever uh that really kind of influenced things when you were growing up your adolescence and uh, that's kind of how I'm going to frame this thing with adolescence, the young adulthood, and then the military, pre military, post military kind of stages of uh, our adulthoods. Um, not to diminish dad at all, uh, but dad was a truck driver. So he, uh, he used to run, you know, the full coast, uh, coast to coast. I was living in Pennsylvania. He would run to California a lot. So he'd be right. gone. Yeah, he'd be gone eight, uh, eight to 14 days at a time. It is what it is. Um, I didn't really, uh, I, I mean, I never blamed or anything like that. Um, my uncle on my mother's side, Jim, he was, uh, pretty big. He's, uh, pretty smart, pretty logical, very Spock-like, probably had a lot to do with it. And then a friend of the family, I used to just, uh, kind of get out of the house with him because I, I had a, a mother and two sisters at the time. Mm. My brother, my brother was born when I was 16, so, like, yeah. uh, I didn't hang out with him too much. <laughs> so uh, I was stuck there with three girls, and uh, Jerry would take me to go, and he would, we'd go hunting, and you know he had pigs and stuff like that. So uh, we'd feed the pigs, and you know just just work and keep me out of trouble, really more or less. Wow, the, those were probably the the big three. Wow, yeah, yeah, that would be that would be kind of rough, a bit, and, and like, and it's it's like a de facto single mom household. Um, I guess, kind of, like, you know, I talk to my dad and stuff like, like, I mean, we talk, we get along, it, it, there's nothing, you know, sure, nothing sure. untoward to the whole situation, just he was doing what he had to do, that yeah, kind of yeah. is what it is. Yeah, that was his so, job, right? It's like, yeah. mili- it's like military parents, right, you know? Yeah. Hey, who's dad? He's that guy who's gone for six months out of every year. Yeah. If you're lucky. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't really much of a hell raiser, but it was a strict household. So usually the first day Dad was home was the day of reckoning for what I've been up to for the last two weeks. 
<laughs> Dad gets home from 14 days of hard, long, you know, sleepless and thankless truck driving. And what does he got to do? He's got to break in that new belt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, pretty much. That's, that sums that shit up in a heartbeat. So your mom has kept a, a tally, son. And the good news is, is that it's less than last time. The bad news is that it's still 43 licks. Uh, yeah. Where do you want these? <laughs> yeah, really. Her retribution is merciless. Uh, yeah. Okay, so not to make light of that either. But, um, okay, so, you know, adolescence being what it is, uh, you know, I mean, that could be pretty serious. But outside the outside of the house, uh, and, and obviously you had kind of an extended family supporting you there, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, what about uh, any anything like that, uh, media or... Any external authority figures, like teachers and stuff like that? Do you have any that really stick out or come to No, mind? not that I had any particular affinity for. I mean, I kind of lived out in the country, and, um, yeah, just chased girls, you know, mm. play, played outside. I had, a, you know, I, I played inside, played outside, but that, that was pretty much it. Like, you know, I had friends and stuff like that, but no, nobody I considered <coughs> influential. I was kind of the... The mastermind, if you will. <laughs> Every pack has an alpha. I was kind of the that the alpha of the pack, but uh, I had to. But I really liked hanging out with the older guys anyway. So whenever they were around, I tried to do what they were doing. Sure, and and so, okay, looking looking a little bit forward, going a little bit. It's like okay, and just for all you uh, potential, you know, psych majors are out there. Yeah, 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 cool your jets. <laughs> We're not going to build a psych profile here. <laughs> uh, what about what about your like young adulthood, your teens and whatnot? Before you know, before you joined the military. Oh, oh! I remember when you were putting these show notes together, and you're like, you got down to point four, and I said, "Hey, I finally got something I got to say." Like literally, uh, yeah, every from the age of like nine through about eighteen, like that was the whole gig. Like, that was it. Like, before pre-military, like, my dad, ever, just about everybody was, uh, my dad didn't join the military, but he was all for it. My Uncle Jim was in the Guard, and uh, Jerry had been in it and was in the Guard. So, like, when I decided I was going to join the military, everybody was pretty much for it. There were, there were no people on the brakes of that train. So, like... Interesting. Like, yeah. Okay. And, and you grew up in uh, what Texas, right? Uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay, so like the southeast. It's, that's southeast-ish, right? Oh, southeast of what? I mean, of America, you know. Southeast of Canada. <laughs> that's kind of southeast-ish, right? You're having a you're having <laughs> a geography kind of fail, a... like nobody's fucking business. Yeah, yeah, maybe I am. Uh, yeah, no, P- Pennsylvania's over by New York. Man. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my God. What the yeah. hell am I thinking of? Yeah, well, you know, this is what I think when I... When, this is the problem of when you have too many historical lessons in your head and you start thinking in isolation of, like, 13 colonies, you know? It, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so, yes, failure on my part. These things yeah. happen. I recognize yeah. this. Uh, okay, so your adolescence to, to uh, you know, young adulthood was kind of just one big blur of much the same. Yep. No teachers stand out. No nothing. It was just kind of that milieu of, you know, running with the pack, doing what you have to, paying the consequences. Yeah, I mean, in like in hindsight, I really only have one teacher that really stuck out at all, and that's because he used to really bat. It was in a private, you know, a Christian school, and he used to badmouth Carl Sagan all day long. Ugh. Every chance, every chance he could slide that in, he would badmouth Carl Carl Sagan. So like the first. 25, 30 years of my life. Like, I didn't even know who Carl Sagan was, but apparently he was a real asshole. <laughs> That's, then, ter- uh, That's terrible. Then I found out who Carl Sagan was one day, and I'm like, God damn, this is one of those other things that I get to regret and right. have to live down. Like, right. It, it's God damn it, the- he was alive. I could have gone and shook Carl Sagan's hand, and in the interim, he died. God damn it. Right. And, and talking about, like, one of the most unassuming, you know... Uh, yes. Yes. Kind, thoughtful yes. guys. You know, one of the one of the most decent humans ever to grace the goddamn planet, <laughs> right? Who, uh, who just while he was here dumped a whole bunch of valuable contributions on the human race, right? And then had his shit ended entirely too early by cancer. Like, god damn it! Yeah. 
so so the I, I never really like cared for that teacher. I, I was kind of agnostic while they teach her, like one way or the other. But now I'm just like, damn it, Randall. Right. <laughs> uh, in the same way, in the same way, Seinfeld would say Newman. That's how I say Randall. Newman. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Newman. Hello, Newman. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, so going in, uh, you sign up. And, uh, and we, I think we've already previously established that you had a uniquely uh, diverse military experience, we'll just say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, I never, never, never really looking in the intellectual, so to speak. Um, I was kind of raised in the anti-intellectual, you know, not to say not, not all that book learning is bad, but more like in the trivia kind of thing like I, I knew a whole bunch of things like from the age of 12 on like it was actually there was some butt hurt in my church where I would get picked to play Trivial Pursuit before some of the adults mm-hmm. and this was rubbing some people the wrong way because it made them feel stupid because so, random useless factoids are wisdom r- right right exactly <laughs> because in the, yes in that place random useless factoids are wisdom it's just I was a large pile in a very small body of useless factoids so, like, that was the idea of education. Like, it was literally everybody bought into the status thing where, all you, you know, uh, is your memorization was, was win and conformity was win and not questioning and just piling in all of these useless things into your skull. And I just had a really good memory and an ability to do that. So that was, like, that was the thing that I knew. So when I joined the military... It was very simple for me to take on my MOSs as I did, because it was just more more information in that pile. Right, so it's basically part of the same paradigm. It was just an extension of it. Yeah. And so, uh, any kind of a, do you have any kind of a insights or uh, serious, uh, you know, introspective learning or uh, inspiration while you were in? Not oh, not for many moons. A lot of it was very practical knowledge. I mean, the burnt hand teaches best. You know, I learned the you know some lessons with women the hard way, and yeah, you know, learned some lessons with kids and alcohol. You know, the hard way. But uh, not until Jesus, I had been in for years. Like my first tour to Iraq was 2011, so I had been in for active duty I'd been for 12 years before anything really started to stir I mean I don't want to say it like like in the military there's, there's a lot of blockheads and usually the blockheads are people who just don't know anything like you can't trust them with a hand tool just like screwdriver put the screwdriver down go find something soft and rub a window. <laughs> like, like there are some people who really are that bad. Like, your your job is to wash windows. For God's sake, don't smash the window. This is <laughs> here's the Windex bottle. Here's the newspaper. You should be okay. Most of the glass around here is tempered, so you'll be fine. Don't push hard. Right, right, and 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 they'll be fine. And so, as far as military people go, and I mean, because there's, it's not an intellectual uh, endeavor, the military. So a lot of people there, like if you have a four-year degree in anything, it's like, oh, you've collected a pile of, of factoids. So, so it becomes this dick, dick raving contest of who's collected more useless factoids in their life, and this is considered <laughs> intelligence, you know? Right. So, uh, so while you were in, uh, okay, so you didn't have a great deal of uh, insight or inspiration or anything like that. But throughout this period, I have to assume you're a literate human being. Do you do any reading? Uh, no. You know, what is a... Uh, Literate, and, smart, good with tools. I mean, it's not like any of these people that you meet in the military are stupid. I, no. mean, oh, I, I mean... Not a lot, anyway. The, the highest GT score I ever saw was 141. And truth be told, this guy was really nice, but he was dumb. Like, he was dumb, dumb. Like, no common sense, no nothing. But he was one of those people who had a, a big pile of factoids in his head. So it's really not too hard to do well on on your on your uh, ASVAB because it's really a measurement of useless factoids. Like, can we give you a screwdriver and will you hurt yourself? Okay, how about a power drill? Okay, how about a uh, cannon? You know, 
Like that's all they're <laughs> that's all they're really trying to gauge when you take an ASVAB. It's not like does this person understand uh, consistent principles? Could could he figure out murder even if no one told him what the law on murder was? No, it's no, it's not. It's all utilitarian. Yes. Um, this guy's really good with his hands. We could give him a scalpel. Like, like that's it. Like he can be trusted to open up somebody's brain case. That that's that's the really high end, that really narrow narrow end on the top, and you know I you know fall somewhere in the high middle. So you just don't. I mean, the ability to drink and run fast and fuck pretty girls like that's that's the pinnacle of military achievement. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I I I said I got out with a 4.0. So, yeah, I understand. Yeah. My yeah. emails were spectacular in that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you got married? Why? <laughs> uh yeah, I don't want to hurt your brain with that one, but yeah, okay. <laughs> the bad people don't show up on time. The okay people show up on time. The good people show up on time and contribute. The great people show up on time, contribute and make it fun. Like that's yes. it. Yes. That's it. So, so I had good days and I had great days, but you know, at no point was I ever bad. At no point did anybody ever try to stop me from reenlisting. I was always encouraged to reenlist. You know, it's like, but it wasn't. I mean, it was kind of easy mode. Yeah, it's just easy. Intellectual lazy mode in the military is real easy, especially when you have a good memory and a whole bunch of factoids in your head. Sure, you're going places. You know stuff, right? So, uh, so this this brings us to the last last step, of course, which is uh, finally you're, you're you're at the end of uh, your period here yeah. in, in service, and uh, this is kind of like the the post military mindset, you know, because we have a term in the military when you're looking at your set own separation, and everybody calls you a short timer. Yep, and it's kind of like you know when you're uh, a senior in high school. And you only have a couple months left to go or something. And the teachers just kind of let you slide with anything so long as you don't disrupt yep. the class. Yep. Because you got nothing to lose anymore. Well, I got back from Iraq December 2011. I got out uh, March of 2015. So I want to say it was... Late 2012, I came back, I got divorced, my life was a little hectic, and I met a libertarian. I was dating her the latter half of 2012, and she had asked some questions. And it's, you know, now I'm wait a due minute, wait military. A Donnie, Donnie, I have to stop you right there. Uh, like, you know, th there might be some contingent of our listening audience, you know, the two of the five people that go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're a female libertarian. What? Yep. Yep. I <laughs> fucked a unicorn. That's right. <laughs> Alpha male win. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I definitely fucked a unicorn. Like I said, so, folks, conversational. <laughs> so, uh, female libertarian in the military. Big L. Big oh, L in libertarian. the military, too. Okay. But here's the thing, and, and this will get you. Um, I'd been in for, you know, 13 years active duty. Big. Big useless pile of factoids, and this little tiny 125 pound brunette asking me questions that I had no idea how to answer. And uh, it was humbling. Not just because she was a woman, but like no one had really challenged. Like, like she undressed me physically, mentally, like <laughs> like she laid my whole life bare and, and showed me what a fucking gigantic baby man I really was because I had never entertained a lot of these thoughts. I'm, I was 33 at the time 34 and I'm like man man this was uh, it was it was pretty humbling I, I could not answer a question she, and I'm, I was smart enough to know that when she was answering the question that I could not answer that as I should have answered it in my uh, constitutionalist rhetoric because I knew that those answers were bullshit. <laughs> so 
So I could figure out fast enough to dodge a question or give a, you know, autonomous blob of an answer that was not a non-answer. You know, I was I was I was forced into politician mode, which was embarrassing in, in and of itself. Well, we're all trained from the outset in sophistry. I mean, yep. this is something public school is very good at. Yep. I mean, teachers model it. Principals, you know, uh, complete, uh, implicitly advocate it. I mean, hey. So, uh, so the baby man, uh, we, we were only dating for, I don't know, a couple months, four or five months, and she went off to Germany, and I was in Fort Hood, and, you know, whatever. It was a sad day because, you know, any day you have to stop fucking a unicorn is a sad day. But <laughs> So... So there I was with um, with my own thoughts, and it was interesting, but it was humbling, and I've been working through that, I'm not going to say by myself, I mean, I've got the internet, which is, I mean, if this was the 1500s, I'd be fucked, like I would just be an idiot baby man wandering around the woods, but... Thank God for the internet because there are people there with multiple, um, you know, there's stored content and then there's the live content coming in every day and you can read or you can, and I had an hour uh, commute in my car with all the 2013 or a good, a good many days in 2013, I had a, uh, an hour long commute to work cause I had moved and I listened to Molyneux and Tom Woods and a bunch of the people that were on Tom Woods, like uh, Doug Casey. Casey's and, the man. Yeah, Doug Casey's got his shit in a pile. And uh, Lou Rockwell. Oh, yeah. And uh, so <laughs> over the course of time, like when I had a question, I was kind of, like at this time I'd been an analyst for a couple of years, so I really dug into my logical fallacies. And really started beating myself up, like man, oh man, how like I'm a professional analyst, I, and I'm like, man, you're a hobo analyst. Like if you don't know these this many fallacies, you're a goddamn hobo analyst. That's all there is to it. So just to bring up my professional game, I started learning all this stuff, and then adding little pieces in. So when I'd have a question, I'd go to the next part, and I'm like, hmm, who's got that one? It's like, oh. So for a while, I was kind of running in the logic circle. And, uh, and getting all of my logical knowledge together so I could start adding pieces on. And then I kept building that philosophy, kept coming in, because I was asking all those political questions. Right. And, and I had to get rid of all my, you know, a lot of biases and, you know, pry that shit out and uh, clean out all the old crap. You know, it was, it was time to, uh, to do some house cleaning above the years. Right. And, and that took a while, but... Uh, when I started getting these answers, I actually had an argument with my mother. She had in her, in her, you know, she's in her fifties now. She decided to take a, an online economics class free from Hillsdale College. Uh-huh. And my mom is a Christian, like died in the wool Christian. So I, I don't know how she figured, found out from Hillsdale College. Probably from Rush or something Rush? like that. Yeah, one of the talk radio guys. Hillsdale's a big school like that. Yep. So. uh so she took that class and she started challenging me one day on tariffs, and you know, I, and I went back to immediately spouting eighth grade civics. Now I'd gone all this time going down the logic road and adding philosophy, 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 and then all of a sudden, I'm spouting out eighth grade civics again, talking about tariffs to her, and I was like, oh man, so that's when I got a little more into Tom Woods and started asking those questions and then I found the holy grail of Bob Murphy and between Tom Woods and Bob Murphy and I want to say there's one or two other ones out there like Robert Higgs and basically uh, Mises.org sure. I, uh, I got my economic shit together to where now I really understand the political arena I, I, I essentially answered all the questions I wanted to answer um so thoroughly, but but more importantly, I had a rubric by which I could answer a future question and not be bullshitting myself or anyone else to do it. A rubric, you know, as a professionally trained teacher, I appreciate your use of that term. Ah, yeah, it, it, it really it resonates with me very deeply. So yeah, so so, so to to sum it up, you were kind of in a uh, almost a Rousseauian uh, state of nature until you joined the military. 
I don't know who Roseo is, but I'll tell you, three decades of worthless would, would sum it up pretty accurately. Well, you know, uh, you have a uh, you know Hobbes who's like you know in a state of nature, we're all it's man against man, it's war of all against all. It's 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 just terrible. It's terrible Face right? against palm, you know. And with Rousseau, it's like almost idyllic, and it sounded like you know you're up until the toy the time the time you joined the military, you kind of had a you know. You had your community. You had yourself. You had, uh, you had. It was it was free of, of. <sighs> free of Im- things that would impinge on how you perceive the world or anything like that. You just grew up in the milieu like the fish in the water, not even aware of the water. Yes. So it was almost uh, like a state of nature in that respect. Co- and co- that completely there, free d- of intellectual obstacles. Yeah, yeah, and really. you, did, you didn't perceive the state really. You didn't yep. perceive any any of these things around you, yep. And so it's just like woohoo, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> have a good time, uh, do what I can, and everything's a, a consequence, a cost of benefit, right? And yeah, uh, so I mean, that kind of yeah, I, I think that kind of sums it up. It sounds like you actually had a pretty good, if not you know necessarily. Uh, it sounds like you you didn't come out of it terribly bad, and you picked up some. Yeah, useful skills, you know, stuff like that, and yeah. uh, so, uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, that's that's that sounds uh, that sounds pretty good. So, uh, so just how painful was that? Uh, all the reckoning with all the wasted time and uh, and or you know lost opportunities and everything else uh, when you finally started, you know, when your libertarian girlfriend unicorn, uh, you know, pulled the wool off of your eyes. I've already told you not to ask me questions like this when I'm sober. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna oh. we're gonna change. We're gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna hand over the plus five girdle of media interrogation uh, yeah. before long. Uh, so, you know, I'm I'm giving you free license here. Yeah, I I mean, I, I guess to truth be told, I'm just fucking grateful I got out of it. Like, I'm not in that world where my head is literally so far up my ass that I just appreciate the warmth and humidity. <laughs> and and I'm really glad that it's not that way anymore. Um, the worst part of it is, you know, everywhere, at the, the TV and every person you talk to, it's, oh, ha- have you seen the great and powerful Oz today? I mean, you and I just like, you know, the asshole behind the curtain? Yeah, I already know about that guy. Like, what are you talking about? No, no, he's a big green head. Lots of smoke, lots of fire. I'm like, no, did you look behind the curtain? No, 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 we're not allowed to look behind the curtain, Donnie. You should know. And and that's what my whole world is like now. So to a certain extent, I was very happy with my head up my ass and and just believing in the great and powerful odds. And now all I see is this worthless man behind the curtain everywhere I look. Yeah. And it makes me very, very sad. So, yeah, I mean, I guess that, you know... That, I'm not saying I'm ever going to have my cipher moment and ask them to put me back in the matrix, but at right. the same time, you know, I would joy a really good steak. <laughs> right, and this this comes back to the the yes. classic saying, "Ignorance is bliss." It's not yep. necessarily that that bliss is, you know, a positive thing, but yeah. when you don't see that you're eating the the tasty oats, and it's you know you yep. think it's at steak. You know, yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, th- that was one of the things that I, I've, I've often uh, looked back on because the first time I saw The Matrix, it was like, eh, yeah, it was awesome. But, you know, I, I couldn't really recognize it at an intellectual level for what it was. I just didn't have the tools. So, but right. now, now it's like, holy shit. Right. <laughs> and every once in a while, somebody. Somebody would look at me like I'm stupid, and I'd be like, huh, listen to this motherfucker. He thinks I'm stupid. And now I would just like to go back and find all of them and say, here, sir, please accept this booze on behalf of my former stupidity. Right. Right. Uh, Grovel. Like, uh, like Dobie. Like, here, 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 have socks on me. Just run around like Dobie giving away socks. All righty. But yes, the plus five girdle of uh, media interrogation. Yes, I'm revealing my nerd roots. Uh, it is yours now, Donnie. 
Okay, so a little segue before I get into breaking Lloyd's balls as thoroughly as he broke mine. Um, the, the purpose for this is we're, we're kind of starting these uh, the podcasts off in a way that hopefully y'all can relate to and understand at least that if you don't understand that there's more to understand. Um, some of the things that we've gone over before, you know, logical fallacies and shaping up your own arguments and learning to get rid of your own biases and stuff like that, they're pretty critical because all of it's for naught. No, nothing we're going to say is e is going to have any value to you and is going to make any sense whatsoever if you're not willing to get rid of your biases, if you're not willing to abandon fallacy as a matter of argument so that your arguments, oh, well, you might, you might trick somebody with a fallacious argument. You might, but... Um, but it doesn't really mean you've done anything other than, you know, stroke your own ego and, and that's it. And I think the real point is that when you're, when you're having a discussion with someone where, you know, you're an adversarial discussion, the goal is to recruit them. It doesn't really matter what your position is. You're fighting for your position and they're fighting for their position. And, and the only reason you're fighting is because you're, you're trying to each change the other's position. And if you've never changed positions in your life, I guarantee that you were just like dumbass Donnie, putting up the bullshit every single way you could do it. And I didn't realize how many fallacies I actually knew intimately, because I knew how to use them sons of bitches well. Uh, I was pretty good at debating, and I would make sense to people, even though I was completely and utterly full of shit. All I really knew, I mean, and now I can tell you, all I knew was... Uh, I knew how to bullshit better than they did. So uh, that's the whole purpose. So sitting around listening to me and Lloyd talk about our childhood, uh, I imagine it's not particularly interesting. But if you can get something from that, understanding where we come from and why, how, how we developed, you know, how does somebody spend 19 years in the military and end up an anarchist? That's a legitimate question, but you're not going to get that in... 10 minutes and you're certainly not going to believe the army made me an anarchist unless you have a whole <laughs> lot of back uh, if you got some backstory then maybe it'll all of a sudden it'll make sense but without that backstory and without all of these other things that are probably not in your toolbox because nobody took the time to teach you that um, that's where you're going to end up I so, just love that declarative sentence the army made me an anarchist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want to fucking right. put a billboard up in the middle of Houston with that or something. <laughs> yep, that's amazing. I got some pretty decent chops rocking right now, <laughs> so I'll put on I'll put on my good old Oakleys, the the, the A frame Oakleys with the chops hanging out. Just a picture of my face on a billboard. Says the army made me an anarchist. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Let people drive by that on the way to work. Good Monday morning to you. Hey, uh, chapter, you know, uh, Channel 5 newscopter, we have a, a bloodbath down here today. Apparently cognitive dissonance has a caused a whole pileup that's had people's heads exploded on the interstate. <laughs> yes, 38 car pileup right underneath this one billboard with this snarky looking bastard. He's got this shit eating grin on his face and nobody can figure out what the hell this sentence means. So. <laughs> yeah, fun <Okay>. stuff. <laughs> so, Lloyd... Lloyd, yeah, tell me about your youth. You know, lean back on lean back onto the couch of quasi molestation. It's much more comfortable being the molester than the molested. I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, my adolescence, I guess, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, nuclear family. Uh, dad's an ex-felon. Mom never even went to high school. Uh, she homesteaded in Alaska in her youth, so uh, early mom. Lots of uh, siblings, all of them substantially older than me. So, kind of like a de facto only child, but I had like five, six, if you want to count, unseen, unknown one uh, brothers and sisters. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, odd. Uh, I grew up in California. So, I mean, that's Sorry an entire, uh, but I just to put things in, 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 you know, a frame of reference here, 
This is the late 70s, early 80s California, and just 30 miles east of the San Francisco Bay Area. So this is a real interesting period. Um, you know, I, it was like a ranching community slash super nerd central. Uh, mm -hmm. Like some of the, because uh, I lived like uh, two miles from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where they designed the MX missile, uh, the Sheba laser, uh, 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 you know, Reagan's wet dream. This was his brain trust. Um, you know, this is where Star Wars was primarily developed. Mm -hmm. That whole boondoggle. Um, so a really interesting kind of little demographic, you know, mostly white folks, but with a good, good smattering of Mexicans in there. And um, they're like my best friend forever now, a uh, uh, Mexican guy, whitest Mexican I've ever known. Uh, you know, and I'm, since we were bathing together in preschool. So, uh, you know, just this uh, kind of suburban bringing up. Uh, you know, back in the days when, you know, a gal with not even a high school diploma and a guy who's a felon could still make a middle class living. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, you know, that, that's where we were. That and doesn't then, exist anymore. No, not really. And so, uh, you know, lower middle class, granted. We didn't have a lot of things, but we always had plenty of food and a decent, yep. decent place, right? Yep. And uh, so... You know, growing up, I got to say, I really didn't have anything, you know, in my adolescence, it was much like yourself, um, you know, being a, with two parents that worked so much, uh, you know, my dad was not necessarily not there, but he wasn't a positive influence really when he was there. Because, I mean, you know, if you're a felon, you know, you got issues, I mean, <laughs> just from Jump Street, uh, yep. be that unwise to be able to get caught up in the obvious traps of the state you got to be kind of unwise. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, um, dealing with that. And uh, so I was basically, I raised myself pretty much. Uh, latchkey kid, you know, that that, that mm -hmm. term came into being in that era. In that so, era, yeah. So, you know, uh, I was one of the rare kids and whose parent, you know, in the fact that I, my parents weren't divorced. Yeah. Because coming out of the 70s, Divorce was like at the 70% rate. You know, it was just ridiculous. Like everybody was getting divorced because, yeah. you know, just all the feminism and cultural Marxism was just pervading the culture. And this new era of, you know, women's liberation was just destroying, destroying the households. And, and that area, and that area, California, yeah, I especially. mean, even more so than yeah. the average. Yeah. And, you know, and, and in that area, California is, is fairly socially liberal and fiscally conservative. You know, it just your baseline belief system out that in there. Oh yeah. yeah. And very hard working, the work ethic was big. And you know, I picked up the work ethic even if I didn't apply it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so you know, I had chores and I you know, I had a little strawberry patch to tend to as a kid and all these silly things. Uh so you know, I worked and you know, I mowed lawns and pulled weeds to get my money for the summer when I was a kid and all this fun stuff. But uh outside of uh, my peers I had no, I had no uh, real authority figures that actually taught me anything of value. Uh, my teachers were useless. I think at age eight they they identified me as like some sort of genius kid or something, and I promptly self destructed because of that with weed. You know, I nuked <laughs> all those extra brain cells. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be that ha that nail that sticks out. <laughs> so, like at the age of eight, I just started smoking pot. Started nailing that nail right back down to average. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so, I, I, and really, I think they might have misdiagnosed it. I think I just have a talent for language. But, so the, uh, my adolescence was pretty much uh, kind of like your own, a little bit of a state of nature, and that mm. it was my peer group. You know, it was the Lord of the Flies. And, uh, but it didn't end up badly despite the fact that we were all pretty much running ourselves so you know that whole Hobbesian thing just yeah, I don't know about that I, I think that's pretty pretty bad idea um, but yeah I mean that I mean that, that was kind of my adolescence in a nutshell was just running with my minor pack of you know my, my Mexican buddy and most of our friends and 
you know, getting into trouble and trying not to get in trouble. <laughs> it was always cost benefit, no morality, and we never went to church or anything like that. And you know, totally public school, uh, and my public school teachers uh, were just <laughs> useless, useless. If they weren't abusive, they were useless. Mm. So uh, yeah. yeah. Sounds a, a lot more eventful than my younger time, I guess. You know, uh, other, other than boring. trying not to get caught smoking pot at the age of 10 and stuff, I mean, yeah. <laughs> which is going to blow any cop's mind, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> especially in this community, in this era. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In any era, 10's a little young. Right. All right, so now let's move into right before you joined... The military, the last couple of years there, the uh, last two years plus the the joining. So, okay, so um, you know, I went, I ended up. Uh, this pattern of behavior led me into uh, high school, and then I ended up in uh, what's colloquially known as fuck up school, where I got my my diploma, um, and you know, I really just continued all this, continued all the same patterns of behavior. But throughout this time, I've always been a big reader, uh, so I was reading a lot of. Uh, a lot of just crap, but also a, a lot of Heinlein, who I, I really started to really started to enjoy. I, at first, you know, just because he has uh, some really good juvenile novels that are like, you know, action adventure, boy meets spaceship, boy has adventures kind of thing. But there was always a really, really subtle moral lesson in each of them. And, and it was super subtle in the juveniles. But I then, you know, as I started getting older, I started reading his... Uh, his uh, more thoughtful work, we'll just say. And uh, I remember when I got out of fuck-up school and I got this useless piece of paper that says, yeah, you didn't bail on us and just get a GED, so here's your shiny diploma from a fuck-up school. I decided, of course, since you know, since I did a, such a bang-up job in high school, I should go to college. <laughs> 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 and let me just tell you, there was no one around to counsel me otherwise. And that's the real tragedy. I mean, uh, no parents going, uh, really? Are you sure about this? Because uh, you didn't really do so hot in school. No, no, none of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was your C average student, you know. Do none of the homework, ace the test, and then basically flip the bird on the way out of the door. Um, mm -hmm. When I wasn't cutting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I decided to go to college. And I, to its credit... Uh, uh, I went to a community college there in uh, the East Bay, and by this time we were out of that little community, and we were kind of in the hood, in near Oakland. And uh, you know, uh, I, I I don't know that I actually learned a lot there, but I learned how to start really using higher levels of thinking. So, uh, you know, and I was really thoroughly indoctrinated into Marxist critical theory. And uh, uh, I think one of my mentors there, wa there was a published poet, and I say that in big, big air quotes because I think he was minorly <laughs> published, uh, uh, named Dick Albert, and he's a really good, really good guy, actually. But um, you know, he just kind of, just kind of a little bit of a mentor in the, in the uh, social cues and everything, because by this time I was really high on myself super narcissistic I, I mean not only am I a socialist at this point you know because I've already gone through a year and a half of poli sci and you know so I, I've done my basic economics and and I've had a lot of cultural theory and oh my god Jesus and <laughs> yeah so I, I'm just super full of myself and I remember at one point I'm coming to discuss a grade or whatever or an anticipated paper that I have to write up on something and and mind you uh, he will be my future instructor for two years and uh, I come into his, into his in his office and I sit down and he's got like books and shit everywhere of course like every professor right and, uh, he, and he's trying to talk to me and I keep giving these little mannerisms like hurry up you know get to your point kind of thing and he stops and he fucking points it out and he's like that's really rude and, you know, I, nobody had ever actually stopped to correct me on, you know, propriety and social yeah. invention and behavior like this. And I was, 
taken aback. And it, that actually stuck with me for a very long time. And uh, this is just kind of like the first... I was like, holy shit, an authority figure that's actually going to... Not from a disciplinarian kind of perspective. You know, we were in his office. We weren't in class or anything. Just privately. Hey, that's not good behavior. You know, that's not virtuous behavior. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of schooled me. And I was like, oh. I, you know, I wasn't even aware. I'm sorry. And I corrected it. And boy, was I mindful of that shit from there on. Mm-hmm. But that was, I think, my first baby step. And uh, the next semester, I, I enrolled in an uh, interdisciplinary studies and letters and sciences thing, which was basically a, hey, let's overview the classics because your public school didn't, te- didn't do this for you because the state. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, all the, so we went chronologically, basically, and, you know, we had to skip over a lot of good things. But we went chronologically, basically, from Plato's Republic all the way uh, to the Mark Singles Reader and, you know, contemporary literary stuff. So over to, over the course of a year and a half. And, uh, you know, that was kind of like the foundation of what I thought was my knowledge. But at no point in any of the preceding 20-something years of education had anybody even stopped to teach me logic or had the idea of, hey, this is a system that thought of thought that you have to study to understand. Never was this uh, brought up. It's amazing how it's almost nobody gets taught logic and they really have to go out of their way to find it. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, this ends up with me and, uh, 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 you know, transferring to university after a study abroad tour. And, you know, eh, that's kind of good. Getting out, uh, traveling will really eliminate a lot of your bigotries. Uh, yeah. Just through exposure to the way that other people seem to get along just fine and not do shit the same way you do. It really can... It, it will erode your bigotries and your provincialism and uh, a lot of your like narrow-minded ways of thinking. Um, but, you know, it's not philosophically big deal or anything like that. But, I mean, it, it's impactful. <clears throat> but yeah, so this led me into college and uh, shacking up with a gal and uh, who is a neurotic head case because hey, nobody ever taught me anything about looking for virtue. And uh, I mean, the sex was hot, of course. Crazy bitches are always. Indeed. At least that's the stereotype, anyway, right? Always hot in the sack. But mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so all that. And nobody ever really taught me, hey, personal finance, and this is how school's done, because I had nobody in my back, in my community who understood those things, who was willing to intervene and, you know, uh, say, hey, are you sure you know what you're doing? No, none of that. Mm-hmm. So I had no real relationships, in other words. Because, um, I mean, if you have a real relationship, you have people who are willing to say, hey, what you're doing isn't smart. Do you know that you're screwing yourself? <laughs> in the long term. Uh, so I ended up uh, financially just destitute. And, you know, and despite the fact that I'd been working my way through all this, I was just financially destitute by the end of my, I guess, fifth or so year of college. And so I joined the military because I was like, hey, they'll pay for all that shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, paid off. And they didn't, but I paid it off. But <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> so thank you, taxpayers, for helping me erase the financial ruin of my ignorant, adu- uh, you know, young adulthood. Well, somebody had to help you out. I mean, yeah, and it was me. Certainly, the taxpayers. Yeah, <laughs> you, you certainly weren't getting out of that hole yourself. No, I mean, no, no. I do that. On, I mean, they do that shit on purpose. Advance that shit. Uh, Twenty years, I would be an Occupy Wall Street kid. Ignorant of everything, wallowing in debt, and one looking for a real relationship, and wondering why there was never one there that told me why this was a bad idea. Yeah, and then of course looking to daddy government for help. But yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's when I joined the military. Oh man! So you came in late. You're yeah. How, yeah. how old were you? I was 26 when I went to boot camp. So uh, I was a good 
seven to eight years older than most of the people in there. Yeah. And yeah. and you can attest to how dumb them new recruits are, man. <laughs> it's depressing. Just as dumb as I was. That Maybe shit's... not as educated, but just as dumb. Yep. <laughs> that shit is straight up depressing. All right, so so you're now you're in. Yeah. So and, and now I'm in, and um, I, I gotta I, I give props to boot camp. Uh, you know, uh, basic military training does pull your head somewhat out of your ass. Uh, you know the some of the things that are, uh, that us cushy, fat and happy civilians take for granted, like paying actual attention. You know, focus. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, a, a lot of these things are actually. I mean, they're virtues. The way they're taught to you are not virtuous. But hey, Sparta produced some pretty fantastic people <laughs> of amazing capability. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm just saying, uh, I, you know, while we can I agree, hey, not a virtuous way to get things done. Hey, if you're looking at it as a consequentialist, yeah. it's pretty effective in some ways. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so, I, so I, 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 I got the there? discipline. Who there was uh, was was interacting with your brain? Who, who there was? Uh... None, nobody. Uh, nope. That you know, I, I can't actually say that. Uh, there was one guy. He was actually uh, uh, one of the older other older guys, uh, Crumpler. I, I still remember his name. He was a SEAL candidate, and uh, he you know he probably made it. To be truth be told. He had the kind of self-discipline and everything that he probably made it, but uh, he kind of, he was the same age as I am, uh, or as I was, and uh, you know he just kind of helped me acclimate a little quicker, and so uh, that that was helpful. Um, but other than him, uh, there I mean boot camp was that was a uh, that was an I was on an island. <laughs> yeah, there were no you know, significant interpersonal relationships. Because, I mean, you know you got nine weeks together. Anything you have is going to be transitory, uh, you know, at the, at best. And so the, the military lifestyle really cultivates shallow relationships. Hence, massive divorce mm-hmm. rates. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, so uh, boot camp didn't really teach me too much other than, you know, to pull my head out of my ass, quit being soft, and to have some discipline. Um and it taught me that I'm physically capable of far more than I give myself credit. Uh, you can really do more than you think you can. Uh, mm-hmm. So confidence is helpful, too. Uh, but coming out of that, I mean, getting to the ship, and my first cruise, other than the coal being bombed 90 miles away from us, was uneventful. It was just miserable. And I didn't really take anything away from that in a positive manner. Uh, but on the second cruise, uh, by this time I'm starting to pay attention to politics, you know, beyond my cultural Marxist frame set. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm regarded by some of the other guys in the, in the division as, you know, really smart guy and all that. Cause I'm a, cause I'm a sarcastic know-it-all smart ass who knows more than the dumb asses who are, yeah. you know, in charge of the division. Yeah. Uh, and they were, they were like your standard, I joined when I was 18, I made chief, and I'm staying in, and because I don't know dick. And this is my gravy train. Hello, I'm a welfare state recipient. Uh, although I'm working for it. Kinda. Right? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, um, in, in this time, I'm, I'm really, really reading uh, a lot of uh, different science fiction authors, as well as some, you know, a couple uh, influences start creeping in. Uh, they're mostly political, um, so Ayn Rand starts coming up because I get some very touchy, uh, you know, uh, tenuous connections between her and Heinlein's writing, and I'm like, huh, interesting. So I, and you know, there's libraries on the ship and stuff like that, so I start getting access to some of this stuff, and I start getting into it a little bit. And so you know, I read The Fountainhead, I read Atlas Shrugged, you know, and uh, they're pretty fantastic and. I start really becoming a minarchist. Like one of those guys who is like the very pro-military minarchist types. Mm-hmm. Like 
like like like all the good conservatives want to think that all the military are full of you know <laughs> i be i started becoming one of those guys i'm like yeah because the constitution that was the oath i took man and you know it, man when i took the oath i didn't give a frack about the oath i took i cared less i wanted the debt erase i wanted my life back i wanted to be able to go back doing the self-destructive things i was doing yeah so you know the that whole military period was uh it wasn't so much of, of an awakening as it was uh i don't know some ghosts of knowledge from the past like vigorously shaking the sleeper i guess if you could if you want to put that into an analogy or whatnot mm-hmm. but uh yeah so um and uh i i had one good mentor while i was on the ship on my second cruise and on my second cruise you know that was in support of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. So, you know, I took part in the uh, bombing campaign of uh, Afghanistan and then later the, uh, the destruction of Iraq and everything. And, uh, yeah. So, um, well, that light show and fireworks display and mass murder and fun and games. Um, yeah, so I took part in all that stuff. And I uh, came back, and the only really sincerely positive part of this is I met a really solid woman of, uh, she's a Christian, of uh, pretty steadfast moral convictions, and uh, just very level-headed, you know, all the, all, the, all the things you're looking for, all the virtues that you kind of look for in a gal, mm-hmm. as well as being interesting and well-read and all that good stuff. And uh, I started a relationship with her. In as much as you can do that on a ship <laughs> out at sea. And uh, so that was like the biggest thing I took out of the military. It was actually finding a sane, rational, and virtuous woman. And, wow. Uh, you know, you yeah, think I found Navy, a unicorn. I know. In Jesus, Navy, mine was just of a political persuasion. You actually got to keep her out of the military. <laughs> right, right. Right, I know. And, and, and granted, and guys, boys, girls, uh, 90% of the chicks in the military are complete psychopaths and yeah. not they kind to of keep their knees together. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and the other 10%, they run the spectrum. Well, I found that 1% of 1%. So, yeah. I got my I found my own unicorns. That's some straight up hodgepodge with that. Yeah. You don't know what you're getting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and she's kind of joined me on my, my philosophical journey. Because, uh, you know, that's what actual relationships are you know, that's what you do. You know, you join them on the journey. You explore things with them. So, uh, you know, we've we've both gone from being statists of some stripe to, I don't know, I think she's basically a, a I don't care about all that bullshit. I just don't like it. Voluntarist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to read Nietzsche, but I understand it's bullshit, you know, kind of gal. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the good stuff. Um, anyway, so I got out of the, uh, I uh, ended up uh, being a recruiter in the military and that's, uh, you know, that you're on land and you're on, you're going home every night. So I had a hell of a lot more time to start researching things and paying mm-hmm. attention to domestic politics. And that's when I really started becoming disillusioned. Uh, cause it was like 2005 ending in 2008 and 2008, you know, that's when Paul started running his election. I was like, mm-hmm. dude, that, you know, and by the time I, I've gotten to this point, you know, I've, I've, I've read, uh, I've read Heinlein, I've read, I've read Rand, I've, I've actually started dipping my toes into uh, the serious libertarian waters. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm currently a subscriber to Reason dot, uh, Reason magazine. You know, I'm, I'm getting there, baby. I'm, I'm really getting there, and, uh, and I'm like, here is our last best hope, people. Let's do this, and, it's, uh, yeah. That entire process is just very disillusioning. When you see the curtain, you know, when you see what's behind the curtain throwing the eggs at, at your Dorothy, you're just like, wow. So you guys are just nothing but rotten egg throwing shills for power. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what, what have, what biases have I not questioned then? And that's when you know, and you know, I, I gotta say, as a, as ridiculous as a minarchist running for office is in 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 a, in a certain way, 
I gotta say, as an educational campaign, what a fantastic job. What a fantastic job. How many people did he lead you know, did did he show the second path on that mm-hmm. on that you know, uh, on that road to, you know, freeing your mind. Mm-hmm. And uh so, you know, by just paying attention to him, he would he would drop names. You know, you'd you'd see him in an interview, he'd drop names, and you'd be like, Huh, I'm gonna look up that name and then you'd look up that name and you find out how deep that rabbit hole goes. Mm-hmm. And because I'm just always been kind of a naturally curious person, I went all the way down to hop. I mean <laughs> I, I, I I am still digging. So yeah, it and you know, the that's what the military gave me. It was basically disillusionment. It, you know, here are all these virtues we say we're going to uphold when we take that oath. And it's patently bullshit because the guys who are, going, who are aiming to be commander-in-chief don't buy any of that. It, you know, universally. And the one guy who actually believes the bullshit, you throw eggs at. Mm-hmm. And he's the one actually representing what we believe that we take the oath for at least in theory, that we, you know, ex post facto rationalize. Mm-hmm. And you're throwing eggs at him. Well, then I, then I don't know what to believe. And so I have to re-examine everything if I don't want to just, you know, close myself off and live in confirmation bias and bullshit the whole the rest of my life. And, you know, I, I apparently didn't. So curiosity got the best of me, and I, I followed that rabbit hole. How dare you waste perfectly good confirmation bias... On an intellectual pursuit. I'm what kind you. of shill are you? I'm telling you, man. I'm telling you. Uh, so yeah, like much like yourself, you know, uh, my last three years, I was in a, I was recruiting, so I was on, on shore, and so I think my last year or so, I was, uh, you know, I have like a 45 minute commute each way when I, when I was back in, the recruiting station, so uh, you know, that's an hour and a half each day to listen to podcasts and stuff, and they started becoming, I started becoming aware of them. Let's put it that way. I don't know how prominent they were, but uh, I started listening to podcasts. So you know, uh, you know, I uh, started listening to Molyneux and uh, 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 Free Talk Live on occasion, and you know, all all kinds of different stuff. There, there's a, there's a lot of content that's out there, and uh, you know, it, it, these things just bring up more rabbit holes to follow down. So I really started reading philosophy and I really started studying economics you know on my own because school never taught me shit about philosophy regarding Aristotle beyond his on poetry and other stuff you know I mean Plato's Republic oh that's all well and good of course they would teach Plato and not Aristotle because Plato has this world of ideal forms and life is just an illusion and he advocates a a, a freaking aristocracy of course they would teach Plato and not Aristotle because Aristotle Mm -hmm. makes you fucking think you know and it teaches you logic Uh, but anyway I angry side (laughs) tangent there um, yeah so yeah, as you can see, I'm still coming to emotional grips with my the wasted, neglected years of my youth. But uh, post military, I mean, I just ke- I just kept following the rabbit hole. So you know, Heinlein, Molly, uh, a number of different podcasters, uh, economics. Good lord, uh, reading Hayek's uh, uh, Road to Serfdom when I was still a minarchist. That was a that was a big eye opener. Really, I mean, it, it really confirmed a lot of the biases I already held, but it explained them. Yeah, and, and it's not so much as an economic treaty says it is a, a socio political one, but it makes sense. It makes sense. And yeah, I mean, just going all the way back. I mean, all the way back to Seneca and Tacitus and and reading the Romans and and the, and and the Cicero. Holy crap, he will blow your brain. Uh, I'm I'm still touching base with him. And you know, just going back all the way to the the, the Greek philo- ancient Greek philosophers, there's just so much to know, and you don't have to. That's the key thing. You don't really have to. It's just as long as you eventually get that self awareness where you can question your own ideas, and really, you know, just just become a skeptic. That's the first and most vital step everyone needs. Just just become a skeptic. Don't buy your own bullshit. As soon as you reach that stage, 
and there's a multitude of doors that are open for you. But before that stage, you know, you're just living other people's illusions. So, yeah. Indeed. Well, <coughs> so, so you're, uh, you're probably about 150 to 200 books ahead of me. What would no you say idea. the, the <laughs> larger, the larger influences were? You know, I, I gotta, I gotta break down knowledge into how you, uh, how do I want to phrase this? I gotta break down, uh, like book learning <laughs> into two <laughs> different categories, basically, right? So you have stuff that explains, and you have stuff that conveys, if, if for lack of any better term, because I myself am not always the most articulate. So. For the stuff that explains, you go to the philosophers. You go to the economists. You go to the people who can explain why X equals Z. Why, why causation is actually a thing. Or, if you want to get really into the philosophy, how actually causation is just a custom that you know we've accepted. I'm referencing Hume here. But, mm -hmm. so, you know, but that's, that's the explanatory side. But if you want the, the, the ones who teach you through parables, who convey things to you that are more subtle, for myself, it was uh, Heinlein. It was Ayn Rand. Uh, Hayek did it uh, through the road to serfdom, even though that's a nonfiction work. It was amazing. It was just it's mm -hmm. very, 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 very powerful. Uh, but, uh, and not to... Not to not to uh, forget about them, uh, the Wachowski brothers, or however their name is pronounced. I'm not good with Polish names, sorry, folks. Uh, the ones who did The Matrix. You know, when I watched that in the 90s with my uh, would-be ex-wife, uh, you know, we were all like, holy crap, what's real, blah, 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 right? <laughs> but it was so very surface. And now, having, uh, having uh, really studied that, it's an amazing treatise on, like, it just touches upon so much in philosophy. It, it's amazing. I, East and Eastern and Western philosophy. It's fantastic. Um, and it, yeah, it, it, it's just an, an amazing work. And I go back and I can, I constantly go back and reference it as kind of like an emotional catalyst. Mm -hmm. Like, cause I'll, I'll like get an idea from a philosopher and I'll go back and I'll, and I'll, I'll view a part of that to just see how it, how it kind of triggers me and what my what my own personal reaction is to a, that segment of the movie in which that's referenced and it's just it's amazing uh it's super deep if you actually go and bother to look up how the philosophy frames that entire film and its entire trilogy it's <laughs> i'm not saying i'm a philosopher child of the matrix or anything like that it's not that influential but it's a great reference point or starting point if you're like just some dumbass who wants to have a little bit of the of the curtain pulled back, you know. Mm hmm. So, uh, yeah. Well, hopefully, y'all have uh, picked up a couple of names that maybe you should look into um, through our anecdotal miserable experiences. Yeah. And uh, hopefully you're a hell of a lot younger than we are listening to this and have the uh, the ability to get a head start. And uh, we're, uh, we're, we're kind of coming to the end of things that uh, we, we've been trying to gear it, like I said, towards people um, to, to get over those initial things because in the weeks to come we're just going to pick an issue and we're going we're gonna to rip it apart. And and I don't mean Christmas Goose. I mean fucking Raptors. Clever girl, rip this <laughs> shit apart. Because there's a whole lot of bullshit going on in the world. And if you're listening to this podcast, you already know that. You may not know how to sift through it. You may not know exactly why. But you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is some seriously wonky shit going on in the world. And it, and it just kind of doesn't make sense. And my guess is that's probably why you're listening to a couple of fucking old war horses on the goddamn internet. So, 
And and you uh, know, I I would just like to interrupt you for a second and just say, and by all means, if what you know, let us know. We are we are you know uh, slaves to your will. What do you want to hear? If you want to hear something else, if you want us to explain something in particular, if you have questions, anything, engage us. Engage us. Uh, Facebook is probably your best bet for this, but uh, there, there's other venues as well by which we can receive messages. And, uh, I, you know, I encourage you to all act, actively engage us in this. Uh, if, you, if you disagree with one of us, by all means, engage us. And maybe we can even bring you on the show. And, you know, we can, we can uh, sift through your argument or, you know, what your question might be if you have one. Yeah, um... Don't sit around and think you know. It's going to be like the worst thing. Because one of these days, it's going to come and get you. I'm just telling you now, you're not going to live in this ignorance forever. If you're listening to this on the internet, you're already kind of out the out the gate and you're wandering around like, so what is yeah. this nonsense all about? And if you're that far along, I'm just going to tell you right now, you are you're on your way to this very very bizarre world of reality is coming to get you and it's kind of going to buy like it's already here it's like i said you're if you're here you know so you the explanations are going to be awkward and they're going to be um uncomfortable but it's not really going to change much in whether or not they're true or not so kind of uh Brace yourself, just knuckle under, and we'll answer questions, but uh, all of the topics get touchy. I mean, that's all there is to it. And, and remember, like what, like what Socrates tried to convey to us 2,500 years ago that we have yet to really take to heart and learn. You know, wisdom is beginning with, this, with the statement, I don't know. Yep. Let's find out. It, it really is. It really, really is. So, thanks for tuning in. Next week, well, uh, I don't know. We might be news next week if there's something. Oh, we could talk about the Republican debates, but every asshole <laughs> brother is talking about that, and they're, it's just so terrible. Oh, God. Like, like uh, talk about it's such a non-issue. Like, this is the dog and pony show that you don't want to. There's no need for any human to learn about this shit. I mean... Uh, oh, I've been I, I've I've enjoyed listening to the feedback of others and not having done so myself, not having subjected myself to it. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, yeah, I, I I've listened to a couple of uh, a couple of podcasts that that did like a recap of them, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not a better person for it. I, I mean. Hey, there was a bunch of pigs, and they were playing in poop. And this is what it looked like. Here's a graphic description of the poop playing, and that was like it. I, I've, I've so, enjoyed contrasting Dan Carlin of Hardcore History's uh, <laughs> take on it with yeah. uh, the um, like a, a three-person panel from Free Domain Radio and how they kind of viewed everything. And yeah. it's pretty much, it's all Trump, pretty much, right? And the swirling mass of little satellites that are circling him, and the big can't quite see out of focus blob of double chin neck beardism that is Jeb Bush in the distance, right? <laughs> yep. yep. And it's just been, it, it's been very entertaining. Um, uh, but I'm just glad I didn't put myself through watching it myself. I think my head would have exploded. <laughs> I, I'm beyond convinced that there is not one Jeb Bush supporter on Earth. Not one. Every single one of them is those the, the, the paid crowds to show up like in the very few times he speaks, and then the media just like, well, we're supposed to push the Bush name, so push Bush. Of course, he's in second. He's always in second. It doesn't matter what he pulls like. He's always in second. Uh, don't don't forget the, uh, the sage wisdom of the turn of the century uh, cynic H.L. Uh, Mencken. Never underestimate the power of human stupidity. Uh, <laughs> oh, it, it's not underestimating it. It's just. At, at a certain point, it's not even remotely credible anymore. <laughs> like, not even ballpark. Who are the Who are these people? Who are these supporters? Uh, they're the very, very rich who are going to benefit from what things he wants to do. That's yes. it. Yes. <laughs> and everyone else that, is paid for. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. And those yep. people are effectively paid for. So yeah, they're all paid for. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it, I mean, it's it's alarming. Like it's it's super super alarming how quickly the corporate media will just roll over and they will push a name. It doesn't matter who doesn't want to hear this name. They'll push it, push it, push it. I don't think he has ever polled. He hasn't polled above Paul. And and I'm not much for polls. I'm not like a huge believer in saying, oh, well, the polls say it's true, so it's true. Yeah. I, no, I, I'm really not there. All I'm saying is there's no one, no one interested in this miserable cocksucker. No one. <laughs> And he keeps showing up everywhere like a bad goddamn penny. Yep. Well, money. Money I, money presents itself. Oh, it's... Uh, yeah, fun stuff. But we should probably sign off let these good yeah. folks let, let them go. Yeah, we'll shut the fuck up now. So, <laughs> um, thanks for tuning in. We'll, we'll have something interesting next week. If it's... It'll be news or something more delicious so uh until then until then we'll talk to you the next time have a, have a great one